Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to take you back about 50 years. Take you to a small town in Louisiana, which is located about 20 miles west of Baton Rouge, the state capital. We'll cross over the Mississippi River Bridge. We'll pass miles and miles of sugarcane fields that stretch to the horizon. We'll see bayous and swamps and majestic moss-covered oak trees, and of course, lots of cotton fields. My little town, Maringuin, which means in Creole and Cajun French, mosquito. <laughs> so there were lots of mosquitoes, and there were also lots of flying roaches. <laughs> At the time, it was customary for a great aunt to help an expectant mother during the pregnancy. She also helped deliver the child. In those days, black babies were born at home. Nobody had money to pay for hospital services or physician's services. So the great aunt would help the midwife, Mama Jo, deliver the child, and the great aunt would also help raise the child until the child was of fetching age. And fetching age is six or seven years old. Then that child would live with the great aunt, sleep every night. In case there was an emergency, then the child could go and fetch help. The other thing you must remember is that in the South, all children are called child. Your name could be Mary or Ruby or Sue, you were child. All adults were ma'am and sir. I was paired with my great aunt, Nain. And Nain was a sugar cane cutter. Nain was a sugar cane cutter because that's the only job she could get. I remember she used to say, child, when I was a child, there weren't no schools for coloreds. You have an opportunity. You study hard, child, study hard, and you can be anything you want to be. My wings was clipped, she said, but you, you can fly. You'll fly, child. Now, Nain lived in a shotgun house. Now, a shotgun house, for those of you who aren't familiar, is a house with a front porch, a front room, which is a bedroom, a back room, which is the kitchen, and a back porch. And it's called a shotgun house because if you shoot a gun through the front door, the bullet goes straight through the house and out the back door and doesn't hit anything. <laughs> Lots of shotgun houses in Louisiana. I remember nights when Nain would say, when the Klan rode by, get down, get down. And she grabbed that trusty cane knife. She said, you stay down. Don't get up till I tell you it's safe. Now, my job at Nain's house was to chop the wood and put it in the kitchen stove. Also put it in the pot-bellied stove in the front room. I cleaned the house and I'd run errands. And I was happy living at Nain's house because at my house, we slept three to a bed. And I was the youngest of six at the time, so I had to sleep in the middle. And it was a little rollaway bed. If you didn't roll the bed away, there was no room to walk in the house. So I slept between my two older sisters. And every night that I was there, I'd hear, move over, you're touching me. Well, now you're touching me. <laughs> and don't wet the bed. <laughs> but at Nain's house, it was just the two of us. It was heaven. And you know, I, I never wet the bed at Nain's house. During the hot summer months, we'd sit out on the front porch, 
and we have ice cold lemonade. The mosquitoes were around, but we would take the old woolen rags and burn them in a bucket and the smoke would keep the mosquitoes at bay. And we'd talk for hours just sitting there, me and my name. And in winter time, we sat around that old pot-bellied stove in the front room and we would sip corn husk tea. Mr. Johnny had horses down the road and Nain would send me down to gather the husk. He fed the horses corn and he'd discard the husk so I'd take the husks home and we'd have corn husk tea with lemon and honey. Those were happy days, happy times. But then one day I came home and I did all my chores. I cleaned the house, I chopped the wood, put it in the stoves, both stoves, ran all the errands, and Nain still hadn't come home. So I went on to the back porch, and I sat, and I waited, and I waited. No Nain. And then I saw a group of women coming across the backyard. And my Aunt Skeet came, and she said, child, you can go on home now. Nain won't be coming back. I said, why? What happened? She said, well, child, Nain took real sick. They say she had a stroke. We took her out yonder to the local hospital, and they wouldn't take care of her. You know they don't like to treat us coloreds out there. So we drove her down to New Orleans. New Orleans, that's New Orleans for you guys. <laughs> 75 miles away. And Skeet said, she kept asking, is we there yet, Skeet? Not yet, Nane. Pretty soon. Hold on, Nane. Hold on. She said, child. She was dead when we got there. Took too long too far away. She couldn't hold on. I screamed. I remember screaming and crying. And my aunt said, hush, child. I said, I can't hush. Why? Why didn't they take care of my name? She said, child, it's OK. I said, no, it's not OK. They didn't take care of her because of the color of her skin. She's just like everybody else. She's a human being. It was just the color of her skin. Just the color of her skin. So I said, I'm going to be a doctor. That's what. And I'll change things. And I'll help everybody. Doesn't matter the color of their skin. She took me in her arms. She said, oh, child, there ain't no colored doctors. I said, I don't care. I'm going to be a doctor anyway. She said, child, and there ain't no women doctors. I said, I don't care. I'm going to be a doctor. I'm still going to be a doctor. And she said, Lord, help this child. Help this child. She held me in her arms. She rocked lovingly back and forth. Poor child. Hush, child. Hush. Hush. Thank you. <laughs>